Thank you very much, everybody, for joining me today. Um, I have a very special guest, Dr. Krukov. He did his PhD in education at the University of Edinburgh, and now he is a qualitative research consultant and data analyst and has uh, coached more than 200 people and institutions in the uh, research papers and in the dissertation. Welcome, Dr. Yara Krukov. Uh, yeah, thank you, and uh, it was a very good introduction. So I want to dive um, into qualitative research because um, in my audience, um, a lot of them are learning into uh, the research process, writing papers, and what we are used to are quantitative uh, numbers type of research. So qualitative is a different set and, and has some spe special features. So I'd like to start, how, how is qualitative research different from quantitative research? Uh, so qualitative research is about uh, qualities of experience. So basically the nature of experience, uh, which means that we are exploring quite in depth uh, with quite, quite a lot of detail. We're trying to understand the specifics of a given phenomenon or experience or, or belief, uh, which means that so the quality, that's why the quality as in uh, the nature of it. Whereas in quantitative research, the quantity is important, which means that uh, we want to quantify our data, which means that very often people work with, uh, with numerical values. So even if they talk about beliefs or attitudes, uh, they, they would be using some uh, methods based on numbers, which means that even these beliefs uh, are measured or they are being turned into numbers. So for example, if you, if you ask somebody uh, how uh, on a scale one to 10, how much you, know, you like chocolate, that means we're quantifying, you know, your liking chocolate. So, uh, so this means, th so that's why quantity, you know, quantitative research has hence, you know, hence the name, but there's always been this conflict between qualitative and quantitative research and qualitative and quantitative researchers. And, and as students, for example, learning about this, we are straight away, we are learning about that kind of conflict and almost, we feel almost as if we have to choose a side, you know, which ones we mm. are. But overall, in practice, what happens is that both of these are extremely important. It's hard to tell, uh, you know, it's hard to say this one is more important, this one is better, because uh, there is, you know, thing, such a thing as mixed methods research, of course, where you, you have both elements of quantitative and qualitative. So basically, the ideal situation is where, where they complement each other and use, you know, each other's strengths to, of course, there are so many differences between these two, because there are completely different types of study. Uh, one of them will be mainly interested in individual experiences. So this is qualitative research. Uh, so uh, in order to gain access to such, such experiences, the methods will be different. So again, they'll be strongly based on interviews, group discussions, focus groups, individual diaries, observations. And then on the other hand, we have uh, quantitative research, which will be, again, trying to usually measure the views of a larger population, trying to quantify this, try to generalize it. So um, uh, different uh, goals, that's another thing. Qualitative research will hardly ever aim to generalize the findings, uh, which means that uh, the aim is not to, for example, understand the views of the whole population. The aim is to understand the views of this person or this group of people, of this group of teachers or this group of students in this particular school, for example. Whereas in quantitative research, again, very often, not always, but very often the goal is to generalize the findings, which means that you want to see, uh, based on a specific sample or a group of people, you generally want to generalize, you want to draw conclusions and suggest conclusions about a larger population. So for example, when you see the findings or studies that say 90% uh, of teens or teenagers in the UK have phones or something like that, uh, this doesn't mean necessarily that they the researcher you know, actually investigated all teenagers in the UK and, and then concluded that 90% of them have phones, but rather they drew a, a group of a population that is general uh, representative of that population, which means that based on that group, for example, 500 teenagers, we can actually make a claim about the whole population. But the aim is to generalize. Some amazing things can be done with quantitative research as well. Uh, I always say it's like uh, you can pretty much predict the future in a way because you can make, again, some... Uh, claims about what's going to happen based on uh, what we observed, for example, you know, people crossing the street in a, in a given uh, place where maybe it's not allowed, 
uh, if you conduct your study in a nice and rigorous way, of course, and from this quantitative perspective, you can predict how many people will cross the street by the end mm -hmm. of the year. So this is, like I said, predicting the future. But then the qualitative researcher may investigate people in the same spot and actually talk to people and ask them, why are you crossing the street? It's not allowed. So, so it really depends on what you're trying to find out, what the goal of your study is. So that would be right. in brief, in summary, that's the main difference. Right. Exactly. One more thing I also noticed a big difference is the sample size. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about like what is a good sample size for qualitative research? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a very good question because uh, it's also one of the most I would say difficult questions in qualitative research. There there are studies that have uh, explored many other studies, published studies. So they based on that they drew conclusions. For example, how many participants on average is enough. And very often they use a concept of saturation for that. The concept of saturation means that at some point when you analyze the data, you begin to notice that maybe you're not finding uh, any more groundbreaking things. Uh, you begin to notice that in fact, like I said, it, it kind of starts to be repetitive. People mm -hmm. uh, talk about similar things. The question is of course, when does this moment occur? And that will again vary uh, widely be between, in between the different studies depending on what the purpose of the study is, depending on how well you develop uh, an interview guide, how well you're actually digging for that information, depending on your participants, how much they talk. So plenty mm -hmm. of other factors, but certain there tend to be some, some numbers, such as, for example, 20 to 25 participants in a grounded theory study. Grounded theory is just a, another, like I said, methodology specific approach to, to qualitative research. 15 and I believe in case studies and so on and so forth. Right, you're right. I have one qualitative study where I, I got yeah. saturation with the 10, another one took 20. And, and sometimes we just have to keep rolling and then rolling until we feel confident that um, yeah. no, nothing um, new is coming up. It's not a moment that just happens and, and mm. it strikes you and you know it's done, <laughs> but you have to make that decision as, as a judgment and it's how confident you are in that. So qualitative research, generally has, uh, is very flexible. In fact, uh, according to some, uh, some classifications, some people call qualitative research, instead of using that word and quantitative research, they talk about flexible and fixed designs. Flexible design mm -hmm. is qualitative research, fixed design and qu quantitative research. So if somebody is interested in doing qualitative study, how, how do they get started? You have to do a lot of reading, you have to have a strong rationale, a good research idea, and based on that research questions, you have to do a lot of readings. It will help you generate some ideas for what we, for what you want to explore. It may start with your personal idea. There is nothing wrong with that. If you feel, for example, in fact, my PhD thesis was based on such thing, on a hunch, basically on something I, mm -hmm. I felt was interesting to me personally. And so it may start with your idea, this is fine and it's perfect. I usually say you have to be passionate about your, your topic if you want to be successful. The single most important thing, and that's it's called rationale. Uh, I would say there are some things that you want to be sure before you start. So for example, you want to be sure that there is a need for your study and that's very important. That's something also many students feel anxious about and even panic about. Very often I talk to people who have uh, they seem to have a pretty good idea for a study. They may have some uh, research questions that are pretty good as well, but they don't have a rationale. They don't know how to answer that question. So when I ask them, okay, uh, I usually say, just tell me why we need your study. So even if uh, similar studies have been conducted, perhaps there is not enough evidence or perhaps there is not evidence from your particular town or your particular country or your particular school. So there's always some, you know, there may be some reason to, to conduct your studies. After that, you'll have to think where to find the answers. So this is basically after that, usually the second step is to think, who do I, you know, talk to or what do I do to get that data? So this is uh, actually a point I, I wanted to make about a common mistake where people focus too much on, for example, I want to do a qualitative study or that's their first decision or I want to do a study with interviews. I've, I've seen people tell me that, and it's not a good, again, not a good approach when you start by saying, I want to do a grounded theory study. I want to do a study with interviews. I want to do a case mm -hmm. study. It's not a good idea. This will come later. The first thing to decide is what do you want to find out? And then after that, 
how do I find this out? And you know, so where do I go? Like, do I talk to people or where do I find these answers? From there, you'll find out whether you're doing qualitative study, quantitative study, what kind of study. So that's that's the only right approach because otherwise you'll be too focused on you know straight away on let's say a method that you you would like to use in your study. It doesn't make sense. You have to start with you know with this what I want to answer first. Then where do I go? Who do I talk to? Do I talk to people or how do I get that data? So gradually you're getting this idea for your participants, your methods and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. And what emerges is what kind of study you're, you want to conduct in fact. Yeah, I, I agree. I, when I was first starting, um, being a naive researcher, I, I also go use that route. Like, oh, I want to do a cohort study. You know, that's how I start. Mm -hmm. Then I reverse engineer it. But then later, the right way is find out what you want to answer. Then you match the study design to your question. Right. Yeah, exactly. And for that, I also blame, uh, I mean, I, I completely understand why people do this. So again, it's obviously, you know, new topic, it can be overwhelming. And I usually blame textbooks and the university instruction for these problems, because it's also kind of the way it's arranged in textbooks, the way we're usually uh, teaching students is, in fact, uh, giving that wrong impression that this is what you start with because mm. what you said is true to me as well at least for my masters I remember I was also focused very much on uh, on you know how I'm going to what methods how I'm going to gather the data before I knew what data I need so so that's yeah <laughs> so that's not not really a, a perfect approach what are the other mistakes that you see uh, students make when they're doing qualitative research mm -hmm. I would say that uh Apart from what I already said, so yeah, lack of, of rationale, that will be very important and very common mistake. So, so they may have some kind of a, some kind of a uh, idea or they're thinking about research design, but before they even think about rationale, why we need your study. So that will be number one thing probably, but uh, very often a common mistake is also, and this, is, this relates to what I said about flexibility in qualitative research. They, uh, they forget about that flexibility uh, and they, they treat qualitative research too uh, too much like like in fact it's quantitative research, and and how it you know manifests itself. There are many ways in which it may manifest itself. It may be, for example, in the way they interview people, where they are uh, their interviews pretty much resemble uh, a survey. Uh, they are just making it more difficult for themselves, you know, because based on that they will never correct uh, collect the kind of data they want to collect. So. So, so lots of that uh, basically resulting from the fact, like I said, that they treat it as some kind of a set in stone science. That would be probably a big, a big mistake. A mistake could be too many research questions, uh, very often trying to achieve too much with one study. And this is something I remember I was taught by my supervisors to be just to narrow things down constantly, narrow things down and be focused. It's better to explain uh, to explore one thing in detail than to try to explore three or five and then never you know and and then fail to really go in depth uh, for any of these topics so that's a very common mistake as well if you want to fix the world with your study then again focus on small steps if you want to you know understand or solve a huge problem then at least make sure to contrib contribute to just a little tiny part of that problem but do it very very well like nobody mm -hmm. else did so that's rather than because you're not going to fix, you know, or address that huge problem with just one study. So that's probably uh, some of the mistakes. So being too, too scientific, that's for sure. Uh, not having a strong rationale and already thinking about other things, like I said before. Uh, yeah, these would be the main problems. And then trying to maybe be a little bit too ambitious sometimes. Sometimes I think one of the issue is um, we think we need some fancy software to start qualitative. You know, we talk about in vivo and different. In your experience, how do, do we need um, these sort of software to do qualitative research? It helps to have software. It helps to have software mm -hmm. at the stage of data analysis. What it does, it's also important to understand what qualitative data analysis software does. It will not analyze your data for you, but what it does, what it will do, is it will help you uh, organize your data. It will help you wrap your head about around your data more effectively. So you'll uh, otherwise you will struggle to understand all that data that you gathered. Even if it's five interviews, you will struggle to understand every single thing that every single person said. If you're using software, that's that's how it becomes helpful. 
uh, but it's uh, firstly so before you know somebody starts to to worry because as i see it a lot students again they, they feel very overwhelmed with the idea that they have to learn some software firstly uh, you don't have to you can still do without software uh, and secondly if you do decide to use software it's very very quick to to learn that software because uh, a common uh, argument or worry is that it's too late. I'm not, you know, I, I can't be learning this software now because I mm -hmm. need to start analyzing my data. But what happens, you'll waste more time trying to analyze your data without the software than if you spend literally one hour or sometimes two hours uh, with proper instruction and, and learn the basics of that software. So if the university doesn't provide software, because that's another thing, I'm not saying, yeah, go and get NVivo because it's ridiculously expensive mm -hmm. uh, if your university doesn't grant you that access. But there are other softwares, including a Max QDA, which is another very competitive software. And again, even if, of course, I know there are also different factors. There are some people don't have access. Some people's institutions don't grant them access. Uh, there are lots of different circumstances in which case again don't panic because you can still do without software or you can uh, you know opt for a more affordable software like you mentioned in vivo which is something i do mm -hmm. use but it's also uh, very very expensive if your university doesn't give you that access usually they do but if it doesn't you'll just have to find something else like quercus for example it's a less common less uh, less known software but it's still uh, useful so overall it's possible without software, but I strongly recommend to do it with software and you definitely will not regret. We have so many great strategies and gems from um, uh, from VRX today. Can you share how, how can people find you or how can people work with you? Yeah, um, well, how to find me is, uh, again, I think the, the easiest way will be, of course, to put some links under the video because because of how long the, the name of my business is and how long my last name and how, how difficult to remember this. But uh, I am on I am on Facebook, I am on YouTube, of course, as you said, I have my website. So, so I'm generally uh, have some online presence. And now, of course, how to work with me. Uh, firstly, I'm always uh, open to, to interesting ideas. So, so that's uh, not for, let's say, training or some kind of collaborations, things like that constantly, as we do today, I'm, you know, I'm constantly, like to talk to new people but then uh, if you're in need of support if you want to learn about research if you want me to support somehow then again several ways i always recommend the first thing to do is to go to my again youtube channel because of course that content is free so mm -hmm. so uh, so there's plenty to watch before you decide for example that you want to you know spend your money on some something more specific or individual but then yes i do offer a range of individual lessons tutorials i i have several online courses uh, so they are self-study courses where you can enroll in, in your own time at your own pace you can learn about research about data, data analysis all kinds of courses i will definitely put the youtube link and also uh the website so it's easier for you, um, the audience to see thank you so much for your time um and hopefully um somebody some of the audience will work with you too thank you yes. Thank you. It was great talking to you.